So now that we have seen the main sort of tenets of structured programming, let's get into some of the details. The first one that we are going to look at is this concept of control flow. Okay? And in this case, what I'm going to be doing is to give you a little bit about what are the different structures that are available in the C programming language and then go a bit deeper into them using examples. And the examples will be code shown on the Replit programming environment. So the simplest form of control flow in the C programming language is the if statement, right? And the syntax is essentially if the keyword if parenthesis, right? The open brackets and close brackets. Inside the parenthesis, I need an expression. And this expression is something that returns a value, right? Ideally, it returns a Boolean value that is either true or false, but we have already seen that C does not have a concept of a pure Boolean value, right? So what it instead takes over here is any expression and the semantics of C say that as long as the expression is not equal to zero, this will be considered true. If it's equal to zero, it will be considered false. Right? So you can sort of appreciate, you know, the simplifying nature of the assumptions that the designers of C took at these points, right? Effectively, what they said is, look, you could have put in a lot more restrictions here. You could have said that this expression must return a Boolean value, in which case you need to define a Boolean data type. Then you have to make sure that this is an expression that has a specific kind of return, right? It has to validate correctly and so on. Now there are a lot of benefits to actually doing that, right? In particular, there can be bugs that could occur at runtime that you would instead catch at compile time by making sure that all of these conditions were satisfied, right? So in some sense, the simplifying assumptions that the programmers of, that the designers of C used are not necessarily a good thing, right? They have led to a lot of problems later on because of code that did not check these conditions properly and implicitly sort of ended up getting mistaken values at various points, right? On the other hand, from an implementation point of view, it turns out to be very simple and straightforward, which is why they went with it. As far as we are concerned, it's something that we need to be aware of, that's all. Now, the syntax of the language is best learned through examples, so rather than diving too deep into that, I'm just going to leave it as a statement out here. The important thing to notice over here is, after the if, I could essentially have a statement, right? Now the question becomes, what exactly do I mean by statement? And the statement over here is a sub-program or a block of code in the language, okay? Now, interestingly, what that means is, I can also have another variant of this. There is another keyword that is brought in called else, which says that if this condition is not satisfied, see, the normal statement in C would say that if, this condition is satisfied, do these operations. The natural question is, what if the condition is not satisfied? And all that it says is, hey, go on to the next statement out here and start doing whatever it says. Whereas, I can be explicit about it and say, if the condition is satisfied, do something. Else, that is to say, this condition is not satisfied, do something else, right? So this else is always a complement to the if uh, keyword, right? I cannot start a struct, uh, programming structure or a, a part of the program just using the else keyword. It's syntactically wrong. It doesn't make sense to start. It can only be a follow-up to an if statement, right? Now, the interesting thing is what follows else is itself a generic statement, which means that that in turn could also be another if statement. What that in turn means is that I could, for example, have code which looks like if condition one, do something else, if condition two, do something else, else, if condition three, do something else, and so on, until finally I hit something where I just say else, that is all the other conditions have failed do something. This is the default. This is perfectly valid and in fact very useful C code also under certain circumstances. Having said that, you will see that, you know, there's a lot of repeating this else if, else if, else if kind of structure and for that we have a shortcut that we will look at later. 
Now, the if was simple selection. Remember the structured programming, one of the things they required was selection. If takes care of that, if else basically takes care of that for us. Now we want iteration. And as far as iteration is concerned, one of the first things is to repeat a sequence of instructions and what C provides you with is this statement called while or the keyword called while, which allows you to construct while some expression, that is to say while a condition is satisfied, execute some statement, okay. And the next form of iteration is something called a for, right. Now the idea of a for loop, so to say, is also there in the programming language Fortran, right. And it essentially says for a certain number of times do the following steps, right, which is why this word for sort of became popular and, you know, is used in multiple programming languages, right. But notionally while and for are actually very similar, right, because all that they are doing is both are checking a certain condition and executing a statement as long as that condition is true. The only difference comes in that as far as the for is concerned, it allows you to do a couple of more things in a more compact manner in terms of how you write it, right. In particular, you can use one part of that for statement to set some initial state. The middle part of the for statement is what is the actual iteration condition, right, the one that would be there in the while loop. And this third part over here in the for loop does something else which is the iteration step that is to say it actually makes some changes to your conditions which because if your condition never changes and it was true to start with you will always be stuck inside the for or the while loop, right. So you could have achieved all of these things by basically saying whatever was the initial condition I wanted just put it before the while loop, whatever was this iteration step that I want make it part of the statement. And whatever can be done with the for loop could have been achieved using a while loop. We will in fact, you know, take a look at that as an example later. So, you know, if you look at it that way, the natural question arises, why do I even have two different things? And the simple answer is convenience, right? Both in terms of how we think about a program and in terms of how we express what we want to do, having multiple different constructs allows us to express it more clearly and in a way that makes it easier for others to understand what we are trying to do as well. That is the whole point of structured programming, right? So even though structured programming stops at the graph theory level and just talks in terms of what kind of operations are needed, when you translate that into an actual programming language, you need to now think about usability. How easy is it for a user to actually understand and use what you are trying to do? So these are the main control flow structures that we find in the C programming language. In addition to that, there is also something else called a multiplexer in which I am using the term a multiplexer or a decoder or a lookup table, right, which is essentially the example that we looked at earlier, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, right, which can be nicely and neatly compactly represented using something called a switch case statement, okay. Since this is not really different from the others, I am not treating it as a, uh, you know, a separate sort of construct. We will look at examples of this as we go forward, of course. So before we start looking at the examples, a couple of general guidelines. The for loop is very clear about its purpose, right. It basically says you want to repeat something n times where n is preferably, you know, known ahead of time or is something that at least, you know, while running the program, you have a clear picture of exactly how many times you want it to run, use a for loop because it makes the initialization, the update and so on very clear, right. While loops are typically used if the condition that you want to check is a little bit more complex than what can be handled using a for loop, right. But they are interchangeable for most purposes. You could use a while loop where you, where others might have used a for loop. It's less common to use a for loop where others might have used a while loop. You do find people doing things of that sort. I would strongly recommend avoiding that, right. It might look clever, it might seem interesting and nice to write code in a certain way and most likely we might even ask you, okay, what, what would be the meaning of certain kinds of constructs like this. But when you are actually writing code on a regular basis, it is to be avoided for the simple reason that you want to write code that you yourself can understand six months later, 
and equally importantly somebody else should also be able to understand by looking at it without having to really worry about you know why have you used a for where this should have been a while or what kind of syntax are you using for this for it doesn't seem standardized these things have their own standard or normal uses it is always preferable to try and go with standardized approaches just for clarity similarly the when you have a nested sort of if else condition it's usually a good idea to consider whether a switch case condition a switch case kind of structure could be used instead right we'll once again look at an example of that later all of these come down to basically the same idea right the program works either way it is correct either way it's more a question of the readability and the clarity and how easy it is for somebody else to use and maintain your code later now with that let's start looking at some of the examples in a little bit more detail hopefully they will make some of these concepts a bit more clear so one thing that i would like to emphasize over here right as before is that the c syntax allows many potentially confusing constructs right in general it's always preferable to go for clarity over conciseness right you may recall that i had mentioned the international obfuscated c code contest that goes primarily for con conciseness but also uses all kinds of tricks in the c syntax in order to make things internationally intentionally difficult to understand right as you can imagine it's always preferable when writing normal code to prefer clarity 